In this episode of the Locked On NBA Big Board Podcast, I have a special, special guest. It is a guy that I've been watching since he was in high school, and I am, I'm, I'm glad, I'm excited for him because he is just uh, a few weeks away from, from uh, realizing his dream or accomplishing his dream. And my special guest is Jordan Walsh, so we can get a chance to get to know Jordan a little bit. Stay tuned. Big shout out to each and every person that has made the Locked On NBA Big Board Podcast your first listen of the day. And this episode is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use the code Locked On NBA for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. I'm your host Rafael Barlow, the director of scouting for NBA Big Board and the founder of NBA Draft Junkies. And like I mentioned, my guest today is Jordan Walsh who is live from a hotel room. I won't mention where he's at, but he is on the workout tour. Jordan, what's going on? Nothing much, nothing much. Just happy to be here. First of all, I just wanted to congratulate you on a good freshman season. I think we met 2020 during COVID. I want to say it's around that time. He was training at at Drive Nation. And uh, I I had heard about you before. And I had kind of followed you from afar. I was living in, I think I was living in Istanbul at the time. And so after I, I met you, I followed you even closer. I went to a few of your, few of your games when you played for Drive Nation. And then here it is, like two or th- three years later, you're preparing for the draft. So big props to you. I want you to know that I'm definitely proud of you. All right, so let's um, let's talk about this pre-draft process. What are you looking to show teams that they may not know about you? Um, <clears throat> I really want to show them, you know, the ability that I was showcasing, you know, in high school and before college. You know, being able to make plays off the bounce, you know, simple plays, being able to facilitate a high level um, and being able to make open shots and create my own shot. Yeah, because I feel like you've been boxed in as this defender. And it's, I mean, you're athletic. You got like this ridiculous seven two wingspan. I personally feel, I mean, you don't have to like agree or disagree, but I personally feel like you did what you needed to do for Arkansas to win. You played this role as a defender and you sacrificed your offers. I think that Arkansas team may have like five guys that are going to see NBA minutes at some point in time. And so do you feel like because of that, your offense has been like really, really overlooked. Um, yes, obviously I was in the role. Um, I could have obviously, if I, you know, I could have done what I had to do to to showcase it a little bit better. But you know, being in the role that I was in, you know, I had to I had to do what I had to do to be on the court and be able to play. And so, so that's what I did. So I want to talk about a game that the, the Kansas game. Mm-hmm. And- you gained a lot of fans nationally in, in that game because it was a big game. It was the NCAA tournament, and you went against Jalen Wilson. And I'm right. sure it's a guy that you've faced over time. Was that part of knowing his game? Did that help you out a little bit as far as just the way you defended him? For sure. Seeing him seeing him in Dallas, you know, I had seen him a couple of times, played him a couple of times. So, you know, it kind of had a, a history and that know-how, of, you know, what he does and what he likes to do. That gave me a little bit of an advantage. That's that's what I thought. It's one of those things. If you if you know Dallas and you know how, I mean, it's a large city, but how small the basketball community is, then it's one of those things. When I saw the matchup, I was like, and a couple of those guys really know each other. Let, let's talk about Dallas. So I think there's could be seven or eight guys from DFW that could be selected in this draft. In, in your opinion, like what's What's in the water in DFW? Why are there so many high-level prospects coming out of the city? I mean, you know, Dallas is a real competitive city. Like I said, I, to me, I feel like it's the mecca of basketball right now. Like, that's where all the talent is. That's where everybody's at. That's where they're producing the best players. And I feel like, you know what I'm saying, if you're going up in Dallas, that's a, a, little, a little different about you, especially if, you know, you ranked high nationally. And if you ranked high in Texas, that, that comes with a different level of respect because you really had to earn it because you was in Texas. Yeah, I had Keontae George on. Your, your, your teammate, old teammate at Drive Nation, he said the same thing. And uh, I had told Keontae, he didn't know, but Kaysen knew, because I, 
I used to film Kaysen's team when he played for the D1 shooters when they when he was like in fourth or fifth grade. What, I remember. what, team, what team were you playing for at that time? I think I was on pro skills at the time. So you was you was on Kaysen's team there. Or not not pro uh this you said fourth grade. No, I wasn't no uh, so he was on uh like I like used D one shooters. I was on pretty sure I wanna say it was either pro skills or it was this team called the Gators. It was one of those two. Okay. Pretty, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, so Kaysen was D one. But I think pro skills at the time was called like Julius Randall Elite, if I'm not mistaken, or something like I think that. So. so like do you feel like growing up in, in Dallas has prepared you at least for like the, the NBA pre-draft process? Because you're going to be going up against guys two on two, three on threes, against guys that are high level players. Obviously, you're fighting for NBA jobs. But do you feel like growing up in Dallas has prepared you for that type of competition? Uh, for sure, because, you know, like I said, Dallas had the best competition. Dallas had the best players. And so, you know, to grow up there and play against those guys, you know, all the time, like me, the Mies, the A.B., the Keontes, the Cations, like to grow up and always be playing, and, you know, butting heads with those guys, like that makes you better, makes him better, and, and then y'all become better for your future. So, I mean, I feel like, you know, Dallas is the place to be. Dallas is the place you want to compete at because that's where all the talent is. If you go there, you're going to get better and you're going to be seen for sure. Yep, I, I agree. So I filmed a video. I don't know if I sent it to you. I sent it to, um, I think I sent it to your dad, but you probably seen it. It was years ago. It was it was a game that I filmed at Drive Nation. It was you and Keontae on the team. And I didn't realize it. I, I forgot Rylan Griffin was on that team. Mm -hmm. I think Rylan is going to be one of the top prospects in next year's draft. What was that summer like playing with, with those guys? Um, I mean, it was great. You know, obviously those guys being, you know, top guys in Dallas. You know, it's kind of like build that connection with somebody you know who has similar goals as you, who has the same, you know, potential and same dream as you that's also as good as you or could be better. Um, to be able to have those guys, you know, to always compete with, not just in games, but just like in practice, like that, that means a lot. So that, that was the biggest part of it all for sure. All right. Let, let's 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 pivot to back to the draft. Was it a tough decision to to choose between staying in school and pursuing your NBA dreams? Oh, for sure. For sure. Um, you know, obviously once a hog, always a hog, of course. But, you know, to, to be able to draw that line between, you know, your dream and, you know, what's better for your future, like that, that's a hard decision to make. Um, obviously in my case, you know, I decided to, to go with my dream and to go with, you know, betting on myself. And I felt like that was, you know, that's the that's where I am in my career. I feel like, you know, there's no better way to showcase what I can do than, you know, going into these workouts and showing teams or being at combine and doing the things I need to do. So I feel like betting on myself, well, that's that's going to give me the best chance to be able to to go higher in this in this draft. Was it a situation where you were like going back and forth? Like some days you said I'm going to stay, some days you said I'm going, or was it one of those things where you were already leaning towards one direction? Um, so I, I consider both always at the end. Um, it was, it was a super hard decision. Like I really sat down with my family, my agents, all my people and really, you know, discussed the pros and cons of each way. And, you know, it, it was really hard, especially with all the love I got from the fans and, you know, the Arkansas staff and my, my teammates, I, it, it didn't make that decision any easier, but at the end of the day, you know, I had to choose what, what was best for me and, you know, I ended up being the draft. Yeah, I saw that you had a lot of love. And one of the things that you did that I thought was very, I mean, I thought it was dope was I saw that you thanked like your your NIL partners and you thanked the fans on your social media posts. I thought that like goes a long way in just showing like like your character. So seeing how like you related to the, to the people, how active you were in Fayetteville and probably I'm assuming you're probably active all over the state. And I, I imagine that was a tough decision. All right. When we return, I want to ask you about about the combine, your experience at the combine. But I want to talk to the listeners about game time. Now, if you're looking for last minute tickets, game time is the place where you can go. You can buy tickets for your favorite events and they don't have to be stressful. Game time is the fast and the easy way to buy tickets for all your sports, music, comedy and theater near you. They have killer deals 
on last minute tickets and they have a best price guarantee. So you can stop stressing over tickets. You can start getting hyped for the fun that you have. Game time has flash deals on last minute tickets. They're easy to buy for any type of event. You get images of the seats. They have a low price guarantee. They have event cancellation protection and even job loss protection. So if you lose your job, Game Time will refund you the money. And this is what makes Game Time different is that they have their Game Time guarantee, which means you get the best price. If you find tickets in the same section and roll for less, Game Time will credit you 110% of the difference. You get images of your seats before you buy, so you know exactly what to expect when you arrive. You can get your tickets in a matter of seconds, two taps, and you're set. And the tickets are sent directly to your phone, so you never have to dig through your email. So just download the Game Time app, create an account, use the code Locked On NBA for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code Locked On NBA for twenty dollars off. Download the Game Time app today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. All right, once again, big shout out to each and every person that has made the Locked On NBA Big Board Podcast your first listen of the day. In tomorrow's episode, it will be with Richard Stamen, Mr. Mavs Magic Draft, and we will cover some of the latest NBA draft chatter. But my guest for today is Jordan Walsh. All right, Jordan, let's talk about the NBA Combine. I ran into you at the Combine, talked to you briefly. I felt like that was like another coming out party for you because I thought at the Combine, I mean, you show that you can defend, and I forgot which drill it was. You you were like in first place in one of the shooting drills. I can't remember which one it was. Which one was it? Was it the was it the star it was, drill? It was middle side, middle side, three side, point middle shooting. side. Yeah. So I was there. I was I was there. I watched it, and uh, I, I felt like that was like like the first like kind of coming out party for you at the combine, and then over the the games that you played. I mean, you you filled up the stat sheet. You had like 10 assists, if I'm not mistaken, like 15 rebounds or something like that. Do you feel like the combine really like boosted your draft stock? Um, I feel like it did. And, you know, that's kind of the mentality I went in with it um, was, you know, going here and dominating and helping myself to make that decision to go back to college or stay in the draft a little bit easier. And, you know, that's that's what I did. And it, it went well. And I'm proud, I'm proud of what I did and what I accomplished there. When you talk to teams, did they say anything about, like, your passing at the combine? So I believe one team did say something about it, and they were talking about how they liked my vision and my passing ability. And so, you know, that once once I heard that, I kind of was like, it gave me, that made me happy a little bit that somebody's, you know, being able to to see that and, and you know, pour that out of, of what they saw. Yeah, I think every NBA team should do their homework and watch a guy's high school film. And I've, I've mentioned it on my podcast to my listeners before, but I had this conversation with Bam Adebayo in Miami a couple of years ago, and I was asking him, how did he fall to where he fell in the draft? I'm a Blazers fan. The Blazers selected Zach Collins over Bam Adebayo. Still kind of makes me sick to my stomach. So I asked Bam, like, why do you think Zach Collins and these other guys got drafted ahead of you? And he mentioned he felt like teams didn't watch his high school tape. He said if they watched his high school tape, they would have saw that he could pass and he could do different things that he didn't show at Kentucky. And how it relates to you, I feel like if NBA teams watch your high school tape, even if it's like your, your tape from Link or your tape from, you know, the EYBL, they could see that you can pass, you can put the ball on the floor, you can make different reads. So in your opinion, how, how much value should teams put on your high school film? Um, obviously, you know, it's, it's a lesser competition, you know, depending where you are, but I feel like, you know, high school is the last time that you can really play freely without having to be stuck in a role. Mm -hmm. Um, I feel like, you know, when you're in high school, there's not, there's no stress. There's no, you know, pressure really to, to, to go out there. And if you mess up, like, you know, you're going to have another game in a day or two. Like it's never, it's not really any pressure like it is in like college or I'm assuming how it is in the NBA. So I feel like, you know, it's a good, that's a good baseline to go off of, you know, maybe not vote your, you know, put your whole emphasis of if you're going to draft somebody or not on high school film, but to have some more, some sort of baseline to where you can see like, oh, this is how he played whenever he had no pressure on him. We can get him back to that. 
at this level, then he could be amazing. I feel like that that could be important for sure. Yeah, because I think the high school film will unlock some things that you may have never seen. And one of the examples I, I, I know because I studied a high school film is Jairus Walker. The role that he played at Houston is not the same Jairus that, you know, we saw at IMG as far as like the passing and the ball handling. Uh, I could say the same for you. Even your teammate at Link, Julian Phillips. Like, I feel like he has a whole lot more game than than he was able to show. So I think teams should watch it again not like solely base it on the high school film but I think it unlocks different things that that you may not see in college because a lot of times in college the coach is trying to win games and he's trying to get a contract extension or whatever and he's trying to put the players in the best position so that the the team can win while in the NBA I feel like I mean obviously win is in, winning is important but so is development. You know, teams are invested in you and they want to see you develop and they may see like, okay, I didn't know that he he could do this. All right. My next question is how do you think like right now, like right now at this day, if I put you on an NBA lineup, how can you help a team right now? Uh, I mean, we hinted on it earlier. We talked about defense versatility. Uh, I'll be able to guard one through four for sure. I'll be able to not only guard, but you really shut down those guys. Um, and on top of that, you know, just being a guy who could, you know, make an open three and then create plays off the bounce. Like if somebody pulls now on me or just a one dribble pass, just something simple like that, I feel like is, is really underrated um, in the game. And I feel like that's that's an important part that I bring on top of, you know, being I'm going to be the best defender wherever I am. Like I'm, I'm going to give that extra energy. Like I'm going to dive on the floor for ball. I'm going to rebound extra hard. Like on top of those things and having this offensive game that, that hasn't been tapped into yet, I feel like I could be special for, for a team for sure. Now, I don't want to say that you didn't have it before, but like when did the your mindset shift to like, I'm going to be this lockdown defender? Like, you know, in high school, because you were, I mean, you were longer and more athletic, you could be a great defender just off your physical tools. But was there like a, a shift where you were like, all right, this is what I'm going to be? So it actually, it shift, I shifted my mindset when I went into high school. Um, for my freshman year, I was, um, you know, I was up at high school playing open gym with a whole bunch of older guys, some overseas guys. And, you know, I was always, like, I always wanted to score. So I would be sitting on the wing waiting for them to pass me the ball, waiting for my opportunity to get a shot. And it would never come. And I, cause I was playing with older guys. They didn't know who I was. They didn't care I was a five-star. They didn't care about any of that. So, you know, the runs ended. I went to my coach. I was like, Coach, you know, I don't know if I want to play anymore. Like, I'm not getting the ball. I'm not. I'm just. I'm just playing defense. He's like, Jordan, you're you're nobody. You're, you're literally nobody. So, what makes what's gonna make them want to pass you the ball? And I was like, Yeah, you're right. And he was like, Okay, so then go get a rebound or go get a steal and then push it yourself. And so once once we had that conversation, it kind of changed our mindset and kind of like carved my game into what it is now. Gotcha. And how many championships did you win in, in high school? So it should be two, but we had the COVID year, so they canceled everything. So we were about to win it that year. But we won in my freshman year, I won in my sophomore year, and then junior year we ended up losing. Uh, yeah, because I was thinking, I know you won as, as a freshman, and um, that was when I first saw your name, and I thought it was ironic because I'm friends with Walsh Jordan, mm -hmm. <laughs> who actually called me a couple of days ago, and he told me that, he used to train you. I didn't even know you. I mean, I figured you guys knew each other because of the name. But um, shout out to to Walsh Jordan. All right. Yes, um, yeah. So I mean, he's a guy that played long time overseas. I used to when I used to do training, we would be in a gym at SMU. A guy I definitely respect. And so um, it, it's it's ironic that you guys your names are, are reversed. All right. So let's talk about and we kind of touched on this a little bit. But what would you say is the most underrated part of your game? Is it the ability to score or is it your 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 passing? I I feel like it's my passing. Um, because I mean, I feel like in college a lot of the times when I had the ball, you know, if I was getting in the paint, people were gonna people were gonna sink and people were gonna come and help help on my man. So I feel like that sort of finishing aspect is respected. 
um, I feel like my ability to pass and make plays for other people is not as respected just because they work closing in, sucking in so hard when I was uh, when I was driving. So I feel like, you know, when I'm in a game where it's a lot more spaced out and there's a lot more freelance like movement and I'm, I'm able to use use my driving ability to get past my first defender and be able to make that extra pass to whoever is in the corner or cutter or whatever. I feel like then is when, you know, it's going to hit people like, oh, yeah, this guy, this guy could, could be nice. He can really pass the ball and create shots for other people. That's really special. And a guy who also loves to defend and loves to shut people down. Do you think you can play a role as like a secondary playmaker down the line? Oh, for sure. For sure. I feel like, you know, the first half of my career, however long, um, I'm going to be a 3 and D guy. Obviously, I'll have to make plays. I'll be a basketball, I'll be a basketball player. But, but eventually, you know, down the line in my career, once my time comes and I get that chance to to be that playmaker, you know, whether it's a point forward or point guard, whatever it is, like once I finally get that chance, I feel like I'll be able to succeed in that for sure. Okay. So, so what's a typical day like for you in this NBA draft or pre-draft process? So, you know, now it's just flying city to city, working out with teams. But before then, it was, you know, I'd wake up, I'd be at the gym at 930. Um, I'd work out on court. Uh, then I'd lift weights and I'd work out on the court again. Um, usually that would be me Monday through Saturday. And then so I'll get Sundays off and then Monday we right back to it. All right, and what are you uh like? What's what's the main focus like in this pre-draft process as far as like areas of improvement? So you know, right now, um, NBA teams want to see want to see me make shots, be able to make threes consistently, especially when I'm wide open. So that's been the focus, you know, just getting a lot of reps up, but not just reps, like game speed reps, yeah. also makes. I feel like that's that's what we've been harping on. That's what the focus has been. And I feel like, you know, we've come a long way with it. And I feel like teams are going to be surprised when they see it. Yeah. Um, do you, you have like a, a goal, like a minimum of threes or shots that you're trying to make a day? Or is it just, you know, like you, you come in twice a day or whatever? Like like I said, is there a goal of makes? So usually, I mean, some days, you know, it's not all about threes. But on the days where it is mostly focused on threes, we're getting at least 400 made threes a day. Okay. Yeah, I think that would definitely open your game because, you know, you're long, you're athletic, and you can pass. And once you start, like, making threes consistently, you'll be able to attack closeouts. And, I mean, there's so much need for, like, wings in the NBA that can defend, knock down open shots, attack closeouts, and pass, and, like, putting it all together. I mean, like, the money – is ridiculous. So. All right, a couple more questions for you. And I talked about your Arkansas team earlier. How competitive were practices? I know Muss is is he's he's Muss. He's fired up. And you had all you know between Nick and, and Anthony Black and Ricky Council and Brazil when he was healthy. How and I can't forget about uh Davis. Like were those practices like super competitive? Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah, in the summertime we actually play like five on five and. All that we had open gyms runs with like all the past pros would come back and play with us. Yeah, they were super competitive. We'd be playing games all day, like talking trash, like might get into a little a little fight or something like that. But I mean, it's super competitive. Like everybody wanted to win. Um, and if you came, if the one day came and you weren't on your A game, like you know what I'm saying, it'd be me on TV on a team. The other team is A B Nick and and Devo. And you know what I'm saying? So me and TV not playing. You know, to to the best we can, we're gonna get killed by them guys because they're they're good guys too. So I mean, it, every day was a competitive competitive journey. Um, I enjoyed it. it; it was fun. Those guys taught me a lot. And I hope I was able to teach those guys a lot too. All right, here's a tough question for you: Who was the best athlete or the best dunker on your Arkansas squad? <laughs> best dunker, just best dunker, probably. Probably Ricky. He Probably does Ricky. something that I've never seen. Like his in-game backwards dunks. Yeah, he does it so consistent. Two, two that I saw this year. Yeah, but, he does. Yeah, it's it's regular. You know. But then I don't even know if he had the dunk of the year on the team. You could say <laughs> if he did for sure. Yeah, and that is yeah. uh, by Brazil. Man, I, I I hate that that he ended up getting hurt because I I thought he had first round talent. All right, last question. June 22nd, 
you hear your name called, what will that mean to you and your family? Um, it would mean that, you know, all the, the sleepless nights, all the, you know, the blood, sweat and tears that we put in, uh, all the money that my parents had to, had to spend and work hard for to be able to put me in the position that I was and that I had to go through. It just means that it was all worth it. Um, that it wasn't, it wasn't wasted energy, it wasn't wasted progress on me. That you know, I I took what they sacrificed for me, and I, I turned it into something great. Um, obviously, when I get there, that's just the start of it. Um, obviously, my goal is to be there twelve plus years, and really solidify my my legacy and self in the league. So you know, that's that's the most important part I have. Um, but you know, for my parents and for my family, you know, it, it would mean the world, and especially especially me. You know, being the guy who was actually you know in there grinding, like it means so much. It means more. It means more than people could imagine. Yeah, I mean, I've seen it. I've been in a gym and, and seen you in there, you know, come the next day, you're, you're in there working out. So I, I've seen you put in the time. And one of the things I admired is your dad would always be in the gym with you, dressed up, yeah. dress clothes. <laughs> 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 Church clothes on. Yeah. 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 And, and so um, I always thought that was, I thought that was dope. Well, all right, man, I thank you, man. I appreciate you, you coming on and, and taking time. You know, you got a crazy busy schedule. You know, you got like the busiest time of your life right now. You got like these job interviews. Really, they're like million dollar job interviews that you're going through. So I appreciate you taking the time. Thank you, the listener, for making Locked On NBA Big Board Podcast your first listen of the day. Once again, it's Rafael Barlow with Jordan Walsh, and we are out.